if you're thinking about making the step to being a liverboard, um, there may be some questions you want to ask yourself. Although around 6,000 boats on our waterways are probably the prime residence of those aboard, the figures for those who go ashore after a few months or a year are much more difficult. From personal experience, I would suspect that at least 10-15% opt out of life on the water with 18 months. Uh, in an effort to help pre prevent uh, potential liverboards becoming land lovers again, I've come up with 20 questions you might want to uh, answer for your own satisfaction before finally committing to the floating lifestyle. Okay, so number one, have you ever been on a boat before? Well, that's not as daft as it sounds, and uh, we talk to plenty of people on the towpath who seem to be planning to move onto the water on the basis that it looks like a lovely lifestyle. Sometimes the sheer ignorance of the new liverboard is breathtaking. So hire or borrow one as a first step. Two, can you afford the startup costs without putting your personal finances under too much pressure? And whether you can buy a boat outright or whether you have to borrow can make the difference between a cheaper lifestyle and one that costs just as much as living on land or even more. Borrowing 40 grand on a 10 year personal loan means forking out probably on today's interest rates, £140-£150 a week. And if you have a house for security and are willing to pay an eye-watering APR, that is. Three, can you afford the running costs? These include moorings, around three grand a year, about £58 a week. Then there's insurance, licence from the CRT or Environment Agency, diesel, and the normal running costs. On average figures and excluding any finance to buy a boat, I reckon that works out at about 50 quid a week or 150 quid a week if you're in a marina. And maybe twice that if you borrowed to buy. Four, are you able to downsize and not get claustrophobic? Can you live your life in a metal box, 60 foot long, seven foot wide, seven foot high, or 12 foot if you're on a wide beam? Some people genuinely can't cope in such small, pay, uh, such small spaces and I'd urge any, urge any potential liverboards to spend as much time as possible in the sort of vessel they hope to buy before making any final decision. Five, do you really want to do this? Do you really all want to do this? Uh, all parts of the family should be genuinely of the same mind about living on board. Anyone whose partner is merely trying to please by agreeing is kidding themselves. A couple or family living on board means the available space has to be divided up still further and you have to be really comfortable about spending a lot of time in a small space with the people you love. Six, are you one of nature's obeyer of, obeyers of rules? If you pay the price of a residential marina berth, you'll need to obey the marina's rules and there's no real security of tenure. Alternatively, if you need to stay in one area, you may think you can opt to play hide and seek with CRT's enforcers who will be trying to see you don't overstay in any one spot. Some people might seem to be immune to the, to the rules, but most abide by them religiously. But trying to run a normal working life, including owning and moving a car, is massively complicated if you don't have a long-term mooring. Despite that, many play exactly that game, of course. So, what type of boater are you? Are you someone who just wants to live afloat in one place, or perhaps you need a base during the working week but still want to travel whenever you can? Or can you deal with the true itinerant lifestyle faced by real continuous cruises? Are you the sort of boater who lives alone with a partner or has frequent visits from family? It all has an impact on the boat and on you. So, question eight. Just how far afield do you want to go? It all has a bearing on the size of the boat you need to buy, of course, and uh, you have the option of a wide beam boat, uh, which could still cruise the wide rivers and canals, but you'd have to go either north or south because you can't get between the two. 
without a lorry or a sea crossing. So, and if you go wide, well, you'll never be able to sample the joys of that big chunk of the system that includes the Shropshire Union, the Trenton Mersey, or even the Birmingham Canal navigations. Nine, will you insist on new or accept second hand? The answer depends on what sort of person you are as well as how much cash you can produce. And some liverboards go through a number of new boats trying to get it exactly right. Size may be the main determining factor with new narrowboats costing about £11-£1200 per foot at the cheaper end. There are lots of good second-hand boats on the market at very reasonable prices and I'm firmly of the school of thought that says get something you like and adjust it to suit your more spe specific needs. So 10. Windows or portholes? A cruiser or a trad stern? For a liverboard this is a matter of balancing warmth and light in winter, windows are prime sources of heat loss, but in summer, portholes can make the boat very dark and dismal. And in winter, come to that. The use of space is critical if you're a liverboard, uh, and it's a very personal decision whether you want most interior space you can get in a set length. Although bear in mind on a trad boat you'll have to have an engine room, so that's not really living space. Or you want external space with a cruiser deck. Whichever way you go, storage is essential and often in short supply on new boats. 11. Do you prefer a pump-out or a cassette? It's one of those eternal boating questions. And it's not really a question about which direction you prefer for toilet waste, but a reality check that you fully understand that you have to be prepared to be part of a self-contained unit on a boat and dispose of all your waste, and that includes the contents of the loo. This is a lifestyle that brings you hard up against the realities of life, and the pump out versus cassette question is usually decided by cost and convenience, with pump outs now costing 20 pounds a time and more. 12, do you need a home base? Little boards face ever-changing picture on today's waterways if you want a residential mooring. Um, there are more of them about. Uh, BWM L marinas have got planning permission, but they're very expensive berths, £4,000 a year in the outside London and twice that inside London. Uh, many marinas may get around the, uh, the, the rules, but uh, if you want a base and don't want a marina, uh, there are only a handful of official bankside CRT residential moorings. Although loads of long-term CRT mooring sites, which may be technically leisure moorings, but in reality are often used by those who live on board their boats. You can negotiate. There's no longer a shortage of moorings. And don't go mad with your bids on the uh, Canal and River Trust auction site for online moorings. You only spoil it for everybody else. 13. Can you go green on the water? Living afloat is about the best chance you'll ever have to put your principles into action and go green. With one big caveat, the diesel engine. You have to decide whether you want to limit your impact by using solar battery charging getting rid of the car, getting a bike, cooking and heating water on the boat's multi-fuel stove and using wood picked up along the towpath as a means of free heat. You can grow some of your own food on the boat in boxes and grow bags or pots. Um, certainly switch to LEDs and oil lights and candles are used by some but there are obvious fire risks. So 14 can you survive inside a steel box in a freezing winter? And the answer is you can if you understand what is needed. The heat you supply inside the boat must be enough to keep up with the loss through the skin on the outside to the air and the water and therefore keep you warm. And that means you need a sufficiently powerful heating system that will achieve that and won't bankrupt you in the process. And that doesn't differ much whether you're on the bank or in a marina, so would your boat cope and can you manage the heat? 15. What form of heating do you want? 
Multi-fuel stoves burning wood or coal are dusty and dirty, and, but very effective. Oil burning stoves or other forms of diesel central heating are cleaner, but more expensive. I mean, gas is almost out of the question. It's more than trebled in the last 15 years. And whilst diesel has gone up from, say, 30 pence a litre to 70 pence at the very cheapest places, at the same time, coal has almost doubled in price as well. Whatever you use, do consider an eco fan as it carries the heat to the furthest nooks and crannies. 16. Do you want to wave bye bye to officials? Yes, yeah, so do I, but I suspect we'll have to settle for the illusion of freedom. You can ignore local authorities if you don't live on a, an official residential mooring and don't want to vote. If you do, especially the former, you may have to argue about council tax liability and the latter may mean declaring yourself officially homeless as a continuous cruiser. Even then, nothing is as sure as death and taxes, they say, and you'll need an address to communicate with the government on issues like pensions and benefits. And then there's the Canal and River Trust and the Environment Agency who want you to jump through their hoops by paying licences and passing boat safety certification. Do you want to be part of the modern world? Well, moving on to the boat is seen by some as leaving the modern world, but uh, in reality it allows you to make choices about the level of communications you want with that big wide world. Uh, do you really need a telly? Is a standard mobile phone enough as a means of communication with the family? Do you want to be part of the Facebook and Twitter generation? Do you need a laptop? Your decisions impact on the power you need on board, but there's no reason why you can't keep in touch through digital or satellite TV, laptops, smartphones and all the rest. We no longer watch telly much, but it still plays an active part in a growing internet uh, boating community, as do we, mostly on our small smartphones. 18. Are you curious about everything? Moving on to the water means becoming part of something different with its own traditions and cultures. Are you the sort of person who takes an interest in the industrial history of which the canals are a key part? Will you start to learn something about the birds, the plants, the animals that throng the banks of our cut? Can you begin to understand what it must have been like to be on working boats on this system? If you're curious and willing to learn, then you'll get so much more out of living afloat. 19. Are you gregarious or a loner? There are loners on the system who rarely talk to anyone or become involved in anything, but they're rare animals and often have other problems. Uh, think of the waterways as a 2,000 mile long 1950s village with all its characters, good and bad, and the same habit of knowing everyone's business. If you're happy to greet every person you meet, pause for a chat, exchange some gossip and accept them for what they are, rather than for what you think they ought to be, you'll get on well. And finally, number 20. Will you survive as a liverboard and still be afloat in 20 years' time? You will if you adapt to a fairly self-sufficient, low-impact lifestyle, travel as widely as you can, see as many of our waterways and their inhabitants as you can, and take an interest in them all. If you can make the compromises and enjoy what you have rather than try to buy a lifestyle, you'll become one of the many happy boat people that we've come to know. If that's beyond you, perhaps you're best staying on the land. <laughs>